Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the... Did we ever record all the stuff you went through with this rifle? Oh, dude, we, we really should do like an overview video on the rifle at some point and all our struggles <laughs> with it. <laughs> okay. But man, is it a sweet shooter for what we put in. Yep. Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be discussing one of the rifles that we use in our expansion series. We'll be doing more videos on the, in the future on other rifles we use for our expansion testing that covers our history with it, the optic we're running on it, accessories and what we do and don't like about it as it pertains to hunting or a target shooting platform. As you may have guessed from the title, today's video is on my Winchester Model 70. Now this is specifically a Model 70 Ultimate Shadow. This is a post-64 gun manufactured in New Haven, Connecticut sometime between 2003 and 2006 when the brand was still owned by US Rack, or the United States Repeating Arms Company. It utilizes a control round push feed bolt, has an internal magazine with a hinged floor plate, a three position safety and a polymer stock. The Model 70 has been colloquially known as the rifleman's rifle, but like most products manufactured for close to 100 years, it has gone through ups and downs. In the early 2000s, U.S. Rack was going through some tough times, as evidenced by the introduction of this model. The Super Shadow was introduced in 03, and like the Black Shadow and Coyote models, had an MSRP of just over 500 bucks. They often sold for much less, in some cases as package deals with lower quality optics, and were seen by some people as an abomination compared to the blued steel and walnut stock examples of the Model 70 lineage. It turns out cost cutting didn't pan out and production at the New Haven factory ended in early 06 due to a lack of profitability. Production would later start up again in the FN Browning factory in South Carolina with final assembly of the Model 70 occurring in Portugal. I bought this rifle used in early 2019 through an auction on a popular listing website. I say auction, but I was the only person who ended up bidding and I paid $4.99 plus shipping, tax, and transfer fee. I threw a spare Leupold VX Freedom scope I had lying around on it and took it out to the field. First shot, click, no bang. Five shells later, still click, no bang. All primers had slight indents from light primer strikes, and that's when the headache began. I took the gun home and tore it apart, cleaned out everything as thoroughly as I could while inspecting components for any issues I could find. The two possible causes I identified were a slightly bent firing pin, and a spot of bare, non-treated metal where the cocking piece engages the sear. I took the rifle to a gunsmith and he confirmed that the firing pin was slightly bent and he straightened it back out a bit for me. Then we tried to fire a primed case. Click no bang. After talking for a bit longer and looking more closely at the cocking piece, we came to the conclusion that either material had broken off the shelf on the cocking piece or someone had removed some material from it, potentially for the purpose of trying to do a ghetto basement trigger job and reduce the travel time of the pin. This seemed most likely as there was very little felt pressure when the pin fell on a primed case compared to a dry fire. My first attempt at correcting the problem was buying a heavier mainspring, I went from an 18 pound spring to a 30 pound spring. Didn't help at all. After that, the only option was to get a new cocking piece. Easier said than done. Turns out that US Rack didn't really sell spare cocking pieces or similar parts directly to consumers because they didn't want people working on the guns themselves rather than taking them to a repair shop. I checked Numeric, Midwest Gunworks, eBay, and a bunch of other spare parts websites looking for the components I needed. I was able to find firing pins for a variety of Model 70s, but not for mine. And cocking pieces for the control round push feed were non-existent. The closest I got was a new inbox bolt with all pieces factory installed, listed at $505, which was more than I paid for the rifle. After speaking to several of the vendors directly, it sounded like my only option would be to send the rifle to a still open repair center which had been approved for work by U.S. Rack back in the day. I figured after shipping parts and labor, I would probably be out quite a bit of money, so I searched desperately for any alternative. If I couldn't get OEM parts, I figured my only alternative would be to go aftermarket. 
Turns out there aren't a lot of companies making spare parts for this particular rifle, and I had no success until I started to look in the competition shooting market. Enter the Tubbs Speedlock. The Tubbs Speedlock was designed by David Tubbs, who is an extremely successful competitive shooter. On his website, he sells certain selected optics, precision, ammunition, accessories, and parts related to precision shooting. The Speedlock system includes a firing pin made from a proprietary aluminum alloy with a heat-treated 4140 steel tip. This makes it very light, and when coupled with the special CS spring, it reduces the travel time of the firing pin by almost 40%. This reduction in lock time effectively speeds up the internal movement of parts, so when you pull the trigger, the firing pin is struck faster, reducing the likelihood of a miss because of shifting aim while firing. Now, all I needed was a new cocking piece, but because the factory pin was basically pinned and welded to the old cocking piece, and because it had been bent slightly, I decided to purchase a firing pin spring combo as well. Together, this all cost $120, which was less than the 505 sticker price for a new OEM bolt. Before I purchased the Speedlock, I did some reading online, and opinions of the system on all the relevant forums seemed to be split down the middle. Some people swore by the systems, some people said they make no difference at all. I don't know which group is right, as I was never able to fire the rifle in its original form, so I don't know if the speed lock system is an improvement over functional factory parts, only that it was an improvement over my broken parts. After installing the speed lock in the new cocking piece, the rifle functioned beautifully, and it has continued to run flawlessly since then. I do want to point out that to get the safety to work, you need to pin the firing pin to the cocking piece, then cut a shelf out of the firing pin out on the safety side of the rifle for the three-piece safety to properly engage. I have not done this, so the rifle does not have a functional safety, and I do take additional necessary safety precautions when I'm using it. As far as other mechanical upgrades, I have a Timney trigger in this rifle, set at about a 2.75 pound pull weight. The original trigger was garbage, and the pull weight was up around a stiff 5 pounds. The stock on the rifle is original. I added a Kydex cheek riser, removed some material to ensure the barrel would be free-floated, and painted it. Over the years I've owned this gun, it has worn a variety of different optics. At first I had a 2-7 power loophole Freedom on the gun, which I later swapped out for a fixed 10 power with a 42mm objective lens manufactured by SWFA. This rifle temporarily wore a loophole VX5HD, and 3 to 15 power, which eventually got replaced with a Bushnell Engage 2.5 to 10. It currently has a loophole Mark 3 HD with 4 to 12 magnification range. One of the features that I really like about this pairing is the long eye relief you get at lower magnification with the Mark 3. When I'm at 4 or 6 power, the eye box is much further back, which is where my head would naturally rest on the stock when I'm standing. At higher magnification, the eye box moves much closer to the scope, around where my head would naturally be on the stock while in the prone. And if I'm firing the rifle while standing, it's likely I'm walking through thicker brush or in a forested environment and having to take a quick shot at low power at closer range, which is a very real possibility. Another added benefit to that long eye relief is being further away from the rear of the scope, I have higher awareness of my periphery. My face isn't so close to the rear of the optic that it sort of blocks out what's going on around me. I was able to purchase the rifle for a good price, and even with the replacement and upgrade parts, it cost a good bit less than a newly manufactured Model 70. The end result is a rifle that I don't mind carrying into the mountains here in the Pacific Northwest, where inclement weather is to be expected. If it gets a little beat up, I won't have a conniption, and with a very durable optic like the Mark III, I know it'll retain zero if it takes a few bumps. It's still a bit heavier than the modern ultralightweight rifles, but not so much so that I mind carrying it. If you've watched our expansion videos, then you know of course that this rifle is chambered in 270 Winchester short magnum. I have developed a fondness for this cartridge since owning it, and I like to think of it as the 21st century 270 Winchester, which to be clear is a cartridge that I also like very much. But I occasionally like to entertain the thought that if Jack O'Connor were alive today, he might just carry a Winchester Model 70 in 270 WSM. 
Now the 0.277 diameter is an interesting place. It's 13 thousandths wider than a 6.5 and 7 thousandths narrower than a 7 mil. For a long time, there weren't modern, sleek, high BC bullet options available in this diameter, but that is slowly changing. Hornady offers a 145 grain ELDX, which we've got a presentation on coming out shortly, which boasts a 0.536 BC, and Berger's 150 grain VLD8 is at 0.518. Now, Berger does make a 170 EOL with a much higher BC, and Nosler does make a 165 ABLR with a very impressive BC. And returning viewers of the channel will note that we ran 165 ABLRs through this rifle with astounding success which goes against the conventional wisdom regarding twist rates and stabilization, and is why I'm leaving bullets above 150 grains out of the conversation. Whether or not a particular rifle will stabilize bullets in that heavier weight class would likely vary from rifle to rifle, and I realize this is what the 6.8 Western was in large part designed to correct. So running the classic 130 grain bullets, I can get around 3,300 feet per second, Modern bullets with a good BC help to reduce wind drift, so this rifle excels when I need to take longer shots in windy conditions. And while those 130s in this chambering don't have a particularly high BC, as I'm sure many of you are aware, we've ran a whole smattering of bullets through this gun in our expansion tests. From 130s up to 165s. But with a 150 grain bullet like the Acubond or Burger VLD, 3100 feet per second is very achievable. Now I haven't gone out and dedicated a range session to just shooting groups with this rifle, but during zeroing we usually see around 1 MOA with most loads, and for a hunting rifle I'm very happy with that. The largest downside to this rifle is the recoil. I think the only rifle I own which produces higher felt recoil is my Marlin Guide Gun in 4570 with full power loads. If I had the choice of running 50 rounds through this rifle or my 300 Win Mag, I would pick the 300. Granted, my 300 Win Mag has a 26 inch bull barrel and the rifle, including optic, weighs over 11 pounds, but it's important to point out that 270 Wisdom in a package like this probably isn't the best choice for a recoil shy shooter. Thank you for joining us today for our feature of the Winchester Model 70 Ultimate Shadow. If you got something out of today's content, let us know by hitting that like or subscribe button. And if you have had your own experiences, whether good or poor with this rifle or optic, let us know in the comments section below. We've got some more expansion tests coming up soon with this rifle, and we hope you'll join us for those. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.